the prayer and I'm going to turn to Psalm 150. I'm going to read that now. It's titled, Let All Things Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Pray God, praise God in his mighty ferment. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of trumpet. Praise him with the lute and harp. Praise him with tremble and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and flutes. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for giving us life today. I know that you're here among us, Lord, and I hope and I pray that you're here and you help guide us through this service and that we all gain something from your word. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. So today we're going to talk about praying in the Holy Spirit. So if you turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 26 through 30. Romans chapter 8, verse 26 through 30. This is Paul. Paul wrote Romans. So this is Paul's word. And I'm going to read, starting with verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Verse 27. Now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is. Because he makes intercessions for the saints according to the will of God. Verse 28. And we know that all things work together for the good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Verse 29. For him he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Verse 30. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. This is the word of the Lord. So today we're going to talk about praying in the Holy Spirit. So there was an orphanage run by a man named George Mueller in England. And it was looking pretty bleak for Mr. Mueller and the children. It was time for breakfast, and there was no food to be had in the orphanage. There was a small girl whose father was a friend of Mr. Mueller had come to visit the home. Mr. Mueller took her hand and said, come and see what our father will do. In the dining room, long tables were set with empty plates and empty mugs. Not only was there no food in the kitchen, but there was no money for Mr. Mueller to buy food. Mueller prayed, Dear Father, we thank thee for what thou art doing to give us to eat. Immediately, they heard a knock at the door. When they opened it, there stood the local baker. He said, Mr. Mueller, I could not sleep last night. Somehow I felt that you had no bread for breakfast. So I got up at two o'clock and baked fresh bread. Here it is. Mueller thanked him and gave praise to God. Soon a second knock was heard. It was the milkman. His cart had broken down in front of the orphanage. He said he would like to give the children the milk so he could empty the cart and repair it. God answers prayer. He wants us involved in his eternal purpose. As a loving father, he wants us to come to him and ask in faith. The spirit-filled Christian is a praying Christian who walks by faith, trusting his heavenly father to provide daily. Listen to that. The spirit-filled Christian, he wants us to come to him and ask in faith. Spirit-filled Christian is a praying Christian who walks by faith, trusting his heavenly father to provide daily. I was at the gym this morning. 
I got up early. I went to the gym and working out. And I was thinking about today. I was thinking, you know, I probably took this for granted that I was going to wake up and go to the gym and be able to run two miles and then lift weights. How many of us every day take every day for granted? Every day is a gift from the Lord. We should open up every day with prayer. The life of a Christian is a daily spirit controlled life. It is not a life designed just for the weekend or just for Sunday or just for the church. It is a life designed for the home, the school, the place of employment, the office, the kitchen, wherever you are. What I'm saying here is prayer isn't just a small little thing that you do on Sundays or at church. Prayer should be everywhere you want it to be every day. When Lillian and I go out to eat, we always start our meal and here at the house, but if we go out to eat, we always start our meal with prayer. And I catch a lot of people in the restaurant staring at us. It's unusual in America to see people praying in the open. I don't know why, but I think a lot of people are ashamed to pray. It is there that God expects us to live in a spirit-filled life. The spirit-filled life is not a religious cop-out. It is designed to meet the need of every moment of your week and to be your source of strength and power right through all the difficulties of each day. You need to pray every day to get through the difficulties of every day. So I'm going to break down verses 26 through 30 a little bit at a time. So we're going to start with 26 through 27. This is the Apostle Paul who wrote this. He wrote in Romans 8, 26, 27, words of encouragement for troubled, filled days. He said, in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. God wants us to ask. One of the great mysteries of life is prayer. God the Father takes joy in answering prayer. It is our responsibility to go to him and to enter into fellowship with him. Prayer is more than just asking God for things. I think that's what, if you were to ask 100 people on the street, what is prayer? They would probably, most of them would give you the answer, asking for things. I think before we go any further, we need to realize God knows what you need, and he will give you what you need. He may not give you what you ask for, but he will give you what you need. It is an attitude. Prayer is an attitude. It is a way of life. It involves formal prayers as, as when we come to him in worship. And it is also when we come before him silently in a classroom, a business venture, or in a public setting. I pray every day when I'm driving to work because I have to be at work at one o'clock in the morning. And here in America, we have a problem with people that drink quite a bit. So when I leave my house and it's nighttime, I pray that I don't get into an accident or a deer or something doesn't jump in front of me. But I usually pray silently as I'm driving. In Ephesians 6.18, the Apostle Paul asked the church at Ephesus to pray for him in his ministry. He said, with all prayer and petition, Pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. There are other times when life is just simply too big and too complex, and we do not know what to ask for. In such times, we know neither what to pray for nor how to present our petitions as we ought. This is when the Holy Spirit intercedes in our behalf. He graciously shares with us the bearing of this burden. 
He gives wisdom to all who come and ask him. James 1, 5 through 6 says it this way. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. This is very important. If you lack wisdom, ask him, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach. Jesus is our perfect example of praying in the Spirit. He was the perfect Spirit-filled man. Luke, one of the apostles, the Greek physician, gives a good summary of the Holy Spirit's ministry in Jesus. Jesus was also baptized, and while he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came out of heaven, You are my beloved Son. In you I am well pleased. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness. And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread throughout the surrounding district. And he began teaching in their synagogues, and was praised by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And it was his custom. He entered the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he stood up on, to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim the release to captives, and to recover of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. This is found in Luke 3, verses 21 through 22, and then verse chapter 4, verse 1, and then 14 through 18. Talks about Jesus being baptized, the beginning of his ministry. He's rejected at Nazareth. And he was sent to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovering the sight of the blind, and to set liberty to those who were oppressed. Why did Jesus pray? He prayed to maintain the intimate love relationship with his father. Jesus experienced unbroken sweet communion between he and his father. Throughout the four gospels, we find Jesus abiding in the presence of the father. He sought to do the will of the father. Where did Jesus pray? He prayed everywhere, with his disciples, in small groups, with Peter, James, and John. He prayed alone in the mountains. He prayed on a picnic with his disciples by the lakeside. Everywhere you look in the New Testament, Jesus prayed. You can do that too. Prayer doesn't have to be something you do Sunday morning at church. What they're trying to tell you here is prayer is a direct link between you and the Father, and it can be done anywhere at any time. God loves prayer just as much as he loves you. He sent his only son to die on the cross for you. He loves prayer. He loves it when you talk to him. Jesus prayed without ceasing. He continually prayed throughout the New Testament. It was his custom to pray. He prayed before making important decisions. And when he called the 12, how many of you do that? Before you have an important decision in your life, you're going to buy a car, you're going to buy a house, you're going to expand your family. Maybe you're going to buy a piece of land. Do you come to the Lord in prayer before this? Maybe there's an important thing you have to do at work, a meeting or a presentation. Do you come to the Lord before this and seek his guidance and his will? 
Jesus did. He asked for the Father's guidance. He spent the entire night praying for the Father's will. The way I look at it, if it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. If Jesus prayed, I should pray. What did Jesus pray for? He prayed for himself, as we all should. He prayed for the disciples to know spiritual truths. Flesh and blood is not revealed this unto you, but my Father who is in heaven. He prayed for Peter when he said, I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. In warning Peter, the very night of his denial, Jesus said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to shift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. This is in Luke 22, 31 through 32. Jesus not only prayed for those close to him, he prayed for his enemies, just as we should. We should pray for our neighbors. We should pray for those people who maybe are prejudiced towards us or racist. We should pray for everyone, not just for the people that are nice to us. He encouraged them to pray and not to become weighed down by the worries of life. You should take the burden that is on you and lift it off and give it to the Holy Spirit. Let him deal with this. I know worrying is something that is innate to humans. Say, what did Jesus say? Does, does God not care more for you than the birds of the field? You should let your burdens be lifted daily. Don't worry about it. Come to the Lord in prayer. But keep on the alert at all times praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. That's in Luke 21, 36. Let me repeat that. But keep on the alert at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Not only did Jesus pray with a deep burden and sense of urgency for his disciples, but he also prayed for strength for himself. Have you ever listened to the groanings of Jesus as he prayed? And he came out and proceeded as it was his custom to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples also followed him. When he arrived at the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and began to pray. Now, a stone's throw isn't very far. Probably they could see each other. He prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Now an angel from heaven appeared to him strengthening him and began in agony he was praying very fervently and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground when he rose from prayer he came to the disciples and found them sleeping from sorrow and he said to them why are you sleeping get up and pray that you may not enter into temptation luke 22 39 through 46 While Jesus is yet speaking, the mob came to arrest him. It is interesting as we consider Jesus as our best example of the spirit-controlled man praying in the spirit, that there is no record of him ever praying in tongues. Now, this is a tricky subject. Praying in tongues is, uh, is a touchy topic. I'm going to tell you what I believe Paul has to say about this. People ask, is this groaning in the spirit praying in tongues? There seems little reason to embrace such a view. All of creation is sighing and groaning. They're not speaking in charismatic tongues. It is the prayer of every Christian. The Holy Spirit makes intercession, even through our groanings. 
Speaking in tongues or praying emotionally ecstatic, meaningless symbols is not what Paul was talking about in Romans 8.26. That's different. We can get to that subject some other day. But in 8.26, Paul says, these are not ecstatic cries or tongues of any special language that is mentioned here. Paul specifically says that the praying of the Spirit is too deep for words or even utterance. It is unuttered. It cannot be expressed. It is felt only in the heart. And it never comes to the surface of the lips. It never can be expressed. In other words, these are those deep yearnings of the soul that all of us feel at times for more of God for ourselves. Let me repeat that. These are those deep yearnings of the soul that all of us feel at times for more of God for ourselves or for someone else. This is why we often call it a burden. It is a burden too deep for words. This word is found only in the New Testament. These groanings are inexpressible, unspoken, unutterable. They are without words. Perhaps it is impossible to put them into words. Jesus prayed with this same kind of intense burden for a lost world in the garden. Not my will, thy will be done. When we pray in the spirit, we have that same intense desire of the soul. We love for the will of God to be done in our lives. The Holy Spirit does the same thing for us. Where do you groan today? Where do you feel the sting of sin? or the hurt of a broken relationship? Where is the pain of an empty chair at your supper, supper table, or the crushing defeat of loneliness? Is there the guilt of a conscience that refuses to be quieted, or the disappointment of unfaithfulness? What is the groan or burden or weakness you face today? I'm sure all of us have something in our past that's a groan. It's a sin, the sting of the sin, the hurt of a broken relationship, the pain that you feel when you sit at the dinner table and there's an empty chair. There's the guilt of a conscience that refuses to be quieted. Can you identify with Paul? He wrote in 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 12. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 12. This is called treasure in the jars of clay. This is what Paul wrote. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in your mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. In part, he says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but we are not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always caring about in the body the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, 
so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in your mortal flesh. So death works in us, but life in you. We possess this priceless treasure of the fragrance of the gospel in these old, fragile clay pots in order that the exceeding greatness of the power of God may be manifest as coming from God and not from ourselves. We are hard pressed on every side with troubles all around us, but we are not crushed. We still have breathing room. We are perplexed and bewildered, but not despairing. We are hunted down by persecutors, but not forsaken by the Lord. We are always getting knocked down, but never knocked out. You say life isn't fair. That's not what I want out of my life. We want to be glazed and polished, painted, displayed, and put on a safe shelf. But that's not God's way of producing fragrance. God's way of producing his fragrance is to take the pot off the shelf, break it, and pour out the fragrance. It is doubtful God can bless any man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. When God wants to do an impossible task, he takes an impossible man and crushes him. This is throughout the Bible, throughout the Old New Testament. God always picks the least likely person to do what needs to be done. How is that pot? Where is your weakness today? Do you feel squeezed in? Do you have sickness, disease, heartache? Do you have disappointment, disaster? Is there some crushing experience, tears, death, shadow of death? For Paul, it meant afflicted, perplexed, persecuted, struck down. That was the process God used to release the fragrance in Paul's life. But please keep in mind, Paul was not alone in this process. God was at work in him, just as God is at work in every one of us. How did God do it? Well, in Romans 8, 26, the Apostle Paul writes, the Spirit helps our weaknesses. He was there with Paul in the afflictions, the perplexities, the persecution, and the weaknesses. The Spirit helps our weaknesses. We are mortal beings. We were born, we will live, we will die. We have weaknesses. We cannot live up to the standard that is set to achieve heaven. It is only with the help of the Spirit and God himself who sent his son to die on the cross for us can we achieve this. Help means to lend a hand together. At the same time, with one to help to come to the aid of someone. That is the word of the encourager. It's often said here beautifully, Paul pictures the Holy Spirit taking hold of your side at the very time of our weakness and before it's too late. Paul writes a, paints a picture of the Holy Spirit at this time in this verse. The Spirit is taking hold of you at the very time you need it when it's not too late. The beautiful thing is his power is perfected in our weakness. When we die, he lives. When we lose, he wins. When we are weak, he is strong. When we are dependent, he is powerful. This is what God was doing in Paul. He does the same in us as we yield to him. It is walking and praying in the Spirit. Paul reminds us, we don't know how to pray. Like Jesus' the disciples, we come to the Lord asking him to teach us to pray. 
Praying is hard work. I'm sure if you ask 100 people, how do you pray? You'll get 100 different answers. Prayer is difficult for most of us. It takes thought, concentration, and commitment. Moreover, we're not always good judges of that for which we should be praying for. We ask amiss. We ask for the wrong things. I'm afraid we often come to the Father asking for things that displease him. We pray for things unprofitable for us in our walk with him. Paul prayed intensely on three, on three occasions for the thorn to be removed. If you look at 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9, it says, this is Paul. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Think about that. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. God didn't remove the thorn. He gave Paul grace to grow through the thorns of his life. In the process of suffering, Paul grew in the likeness of Christ. We do not know what is best for us because we do not have God's overall perspective of what he is doing. Not only in our lives, but also in the lives of those about us who, in one way or another, are impacted by our lives. There are always those who are silently watching us and observing how we live the Christian life. Think about it. As a Christian, you are constantly being watched. And I'm sure the non-Christians around us, and I've seen this at work, the minute you do something that they feel is non-Christian, they let you know about it. There's always those who are silently watching us and observing how we live the Christian life. They are influenced by how we handle our weakness. Do they see us as instruments of God's grace? At work, say something good happens. Do you praise the Lord? Do you say out loud, praise God? From our human perspective, we don't always see how God is using our situation to impact others for his good. Our perspective is of circumstance, radically changes when we get eternity into the picture. Isn't it wonderful to know that when we don't know how to pray or what to do, the Holy Spirit comes to our aid? He doesn't take the entire load. He really shouldn't help us in the maturation process. We still have our personal responsibility. However, he helps us in working out the problems and overcoming the difficulties. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us. The word for intercede is found only here in the New Testament. It means to meet, to turn to, approach, appeal, petition, the word intercession is a picturesque word of rescue by one who happens on, one who is in trouble and in his behalf pleads with uttered groanings or with sighs that baffle words. This is the work of our helper, the Holy Spirit himself. The Spirit makes intercession for us from within us. Paul says, 
the spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. The Holy Spirit of God dwells in us, knowing our wants better than we. Himself pleads in our prayers, raising us to higher and holier desires than we can express in words, which can only find utterance in sighings and aspirations. God receives these inarticulate groanings as acceptable prayers. Since they come from a soul full or under the control of the Spirit of God, God knows what is in the mind of the Spirit. He understands the intent or bent of our utterable, un, 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 unuttered prayers. He knows the mind of the Holy Spirit, who is always praying for us according to God's plan in our lives. Are these groanings those of a believer of the Holy Spirit? The Spirit produces these groanings within the believer. He knows our hearts better than we do. Paul is not describing what happens to the non-believer. Paul is speaking of an activity of the Spirit. Not the human spirit. The groans are uttered by the believer. The spirit is not said to groan, but to intercede with or in groans. When we cannot find words in which to express our prayer, and we can do no better than make an articulate sound, the spirit takes those sounds and makes them into an effective intercession on our behalf. The unbeliever does not groan over his weakness in prayer. The child of God does. However, I think this articulate groaning is the work of the Spirit in the believer. God the Spirit knows the mind of the Father and what the Holy Spirit is doing in our hearts. The Father listens to the intercession of the Spirit on our behalf and answers them according to his will. These unutterable groanings of the heart are the intercessions of the Spirit. The unutterable groanings of your heart are the intercessions of the Spirit. Jesus promised the disciples. He said in John 14, 16 through 17, he said, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him. But you know him, because he abides with you and will be with you. The spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We have someone praying for us all the time. Christ searches and the Holy Spirit searches. Christ prays for us in heaven, and the Holy Spirit intercedes for us here on earth. What a caring God we serve. Think about that. His son, who we forsaken and nailed to a cross, prays for us in heaven, and the Holy Spirit intercedes for us here on earth. God cares for us. God cares for everyone here. Have you ever sensed a burden in your life for prayer for your own needs or someone else's needs? It's a dissatisfaction with the present experience in your, in your life, a discontent with the shallowness of your present Christian experience. Are you praying for more and a hungering after richer fellowship with God, which are born of the spirit within? It is the evidence that deep within the heart is a spirit that cries out for more of God. <clears throat> there is also the cry of the spirit within us for something more, something deeper, something more precious, something more satisfying than our present experiences. This is always according to the will of God. In other words, the job of the spirit of God in our life is to keep us pressing on so that we don't settle down and become satisfied with our sanctification. The, father goal, the Father's goal 
as the following verse reminds us, is to conform us to the image of his son. What happens? Well, you see the results of such prayer in this next section in the providence of God. So if we go back to our original verse, Romans 8, now we're going to look at 28 through 30. The providence of God. God answers the silent yearnings of the Spirit within you. It is God's way of meeting the cry of the Spirit within to lead us into a deeper and more wonderful experience of God's grace and God's glory and God's person. It is not something that happens to you, but everything that happens to you. Whatever it may be, this includes those wonderful, delightful surprises that God brings our way from day to day. He answers so many of our prayers before we even verbalize them. Think about it, your daily life. You have food. You have a house. You have a place to stay. Hopefully it's warm. You're hopefully away from what's going on in Ukraine or other wars. God knows our needs, and he answers our prayers before we can even verbalize them. This is coming from the heart, from within. These are the unutterable groanings of our heart. However, it also includes heartbreaking and painful experiences where life just seems to collapse around you and you fall apart at the seams. Now, these experiences are sent. They don't just happen. This is the testimony of scripture to the believer. These things are sent, everything, without exception. They don't just happen. They are working together for good to accomplish the deep yearnings of the heart, awakened by the spirit within, for more of the grace and glory and person of God. We'll say more about this when we talk more in Romans. You may have asked God to heal you only to discover he had a greater purpose for your illness. God is teaching us to trust him with everything from now to eternity. He's working out the situation, not to supply our wants, but our need of spiritual growth. Those spiritual needs find expression in the deep, unuttered longings of our heart. They express a restless, a rent a restless dissatisfaction that shows we cannot be satisfied with what we are presently going through, but cry out for something more, something greater, something yet to satisfy the thirst of our soul for God. Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Don't be afraid of this beautiful word predestined. It means that God thought it out in advance just like we plan. A building before we build it. Think about that. Predestined. God thinks out in the future, just like if we were going to build a building and we pre-plan we pre it. So God planned what he is going to do. He predestined. Five steps God takes stretches from eternity to eternity. This is what brings us to faith. I want to make clear that in this passage, the Apostle Paul is not touching the question of why some people believe and some do not. That is his choice in election, which Paul clearly addresses in the next chapter, in Romans chapter 9. In our present passage, Paul is not facing the mystery of election. He is simply describing how God has worked on the lives of those who believe. What has already happened to them as Christians? We look back to see how God brought us to this place today. There are five steps. He foreknew. He predestined. He called. He justified. And he glorified. God did not overlook anything. The five, think about those five steps. He foreknew. He predestined. He called. He justified. And he glorified.
God did not overlook anything. God's goal is that we try to be like Jesus. In verse 29, he says, Though we all share the character of Jesus Christ, God is not stamping out robots repeatedly. There is an infinite variety of expressions of the beauty of the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. The plan began in eternity past and doesn't end until eternity in the future. As you grow in Christ, there are some characteristics of Christ that will become clearly into focus. They are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Does someone here today need a word of encouragement and a simple reminder that he or she, that God does answer your prayers, even in ways we do not comprehend or understand? Our Heavenly Father has demonstrated his love for us once and for all at Calvary. We should never, ever question it again. Now, if he has already made the greatest sacrifice for us, even when we were his enemies, will he not do everything he needs to do to accomplish his eternal purpose in our lives now that we know him personally? He listens to our groanings and helps us in our weakness. You are not alone in your heart. That's where I'm going to end today. I want to leave room for more prayer because today's message is about prayer. So I'm going to pass it back to my moderator who hopefully can lead us in some prayer because we all need more prayer in our lives. And I hope that you got from this message that God knows what's in your heart. He knows the un unanswerable groanings in your heart. And through the Holy Spirit, those are passed on to him. And there's no right or wrong time to pray. Prayer can come anywhere, anytime. Doesn't have to be long. Doesn't have to be short. And think about your daily lives. God has answered prayers that you haven't even uttered yet. He's given you things that we all take for granted. So thank you for listening. Amen.